We've worked hard and made history many times. We've gotten this far because together we are tireless. That doesn't mean we don't get tired. It means we help each other continue on. And knowing one voice is strong, but the power of thousands or millions is stronger. We are the tireless, and together we will achieve gender equality. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Women's Foundation live chat. We are going to be speaking with New York Times bestselling author Sherry Lupina. My name is Andrea, and I work at the Canadian Women's Foundation along with my colleague. I'm going to bring Suzanne, my colleague, into the stream. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Andrea. Great to be here. Uh, so as you folks may know, we are Canada's public foundation for gender equality. We support diverse women, girls, and people affected by gender inequity to move out of poverty, out of violence, and into confidence and leadership. So uh, as you may know, we are going to start a new campaign in the next couple of days on gender-based violence. And this is really centered around the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. It starts on November the 25th and it goes to December the 10th. And we are going to actually do a live launch of this on Facebook. And to learn more about this, of course, you can go to our website, canadianwomen.org. But I just wanna share with you very briefly that we're going to do a number of campaign activities that we can all participate in. And this is an example. We can go and set up a lot our own digital events and do something in our own community online, on screen. We can do things like um, signing a letter on a national action plan on gender-based violence. We can do um, a signal for help, something that we'll show you at the end of this uh, meeting as well. And there's a bunch of activities that really center on us being really active during this time. So Suzanne and I are really pleased and thrilled about that. We're going to get going on that. And to learn more, of course, go to our website, canadianwomen.org, and you'll be able to find all the information there. So we are here with Sherry Lapina, and I'm going to throw it over to you, Suzanne, to give a little introduction on Sherry Lapina and her book. Thanks, Andrea. I'm so excited to be here. Really enjoyed Sherry Lapina. Uh, I love all of her books. This is the most recent one, The End of Her, which I don't suggest reading by yourself in the dark. Uh, great book to read around others. It is quite a thriller. Um, Sherry Lapina is an internationally recognized and best-selling author of several fr thrillers. She started with The Couple Next Door, which came out in 2016. And you should know that when she submitted the manuscript for this book to a literary agent, she heard back from them the next morning because the agent couldn't put it down. Publishers all over the world wanted this book and it quickly landed on international bestseller lists. Sherry went on to write other bestsellers, An Unwanted Guest, Someone We Know, and this most recent book, The End of Her, which came out this year, just in July. Uh, Sherry's earned a reputation as the queen of domestic suspense and the mistress of the page turner, that reputation is well-deserved. Her own journey towards becoming a writer had some twists, turns, and surprises. She was a lawyer and an English teacher before becoming a writer, and her first novels were actually works of comedic fiction rather than suspense. We'll talk more about that, and we're so happy that Cherry could join us today to talk about her latest thriller and about her journey towards becoming a powerful voice in this genre. You can buy this book, The End of Her, wherever books are sold, Although we do ask you to support your indie bookstores, um, you can also get it as an audio or an ebook. Um, before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. If we get cut off, just hang tight. We'll be back. Um, and also, don't click any sketchy links in the Facebook Live uh, chat. Um, you'll see chats come, or you'll see links coming from us, but careful not to click anything else. Um, so with that out of the way, let's welcome Sherry. Sherry, we're so happy that you could chat with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. There we go. Okay, so I have the first question for you. The simplest question out of all of our questions, where are you and how are you? <laughs> I'm in Toronto, um, just starting lockdown with everybody in, in Toronto and the GTA, um, and I'm fine. I'm fine and getting through lockdown the best I can. Uh, writing, working, reading, um, making the best of it, I guess. 
Sherry, what's it been like to launch a book during the pandemic? And how have these current circumstances impacted your day-to-day -day life? Oh, well, my latest book came out last um, July, and that was okay. But I had a paperback in out in the spring. And I think all of us were finding our sales were, were lower this year in the spring when everything was locked down. Um, but things have come back. I mean, things are back to normal in terms of book sales and so on, as, as far as I can tell. Um, how it affected me personally, I did find it difficult in the beginning to focus on writing. Um, my, my daily quota was was smaller each day on my new book. Um, but I am I am back to my regular productivity at this point. I think it's just, it just took some getting used to. And I think it's been true for lots of people. It's been a, quite an adapting process. Um, I'm used to working alone in the house and I have a, a full house. Um, so it's it's different. Uh, so we're, we're all doing the best we can. I mean, I've been very fortunate that I can continue to work and I work from home and that my husband's been able to work from home and that my kids can go to university online. So I'm certainly not harmed by the pandemic the way so many people have been with their their livelihoods and so on. So I really can't complain. Um, so I need to ask a question that, again, is another question that perhaps is a simpler question, but it's a very important question. Tell us about your bookshelf behind you. Um, it looks beautiful. Yeah. What kinds of books are on your bookshelf? That's very important. Well, that is actually my thriller shelf. So if you look behind me, I have a little bit of everybody on this one. So I've got, you know, everybody from, you know, Steve Cavanaugh and Liz Nugent and Linwood Barkley and um, oh my goodness, I've got um, Robert Rodenberg and I've got uh, Lee Child and Kara Hunter and oh my goodness, Ursa Sugar Daughter and all kinds of like writers from all over the world that I've met and that I that I read and um, yeah, lots and lots of thriller books back there. I have another another show in my. In, in my living room, that's all literary books and nonfiction and essays and things, but this is my thriller section. Naturally, naturally. Oh. Are your yeah. books on that shelf? Uh, yeah. Yes, they are. Um, there they are, <laughs> they're right here. I would stand oh, up fantastic. and I'm wearing Let's do that. So right there, I have all my books. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I'm wearing yoga pants, so I'm not gonna stand up. <laughs> um, at least you're wearing pants. You know, I give you that. <laughs> I always wear pants because you you just never know. There we go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I, hey, here's a more. I don't want the neighbors to see me without pants. Yeah, that's always important. Um, yeah, did we tell you important. that Sherry used to be a humorist? You, you <laughs> will get that sense through this. Yeah. Okay. So I have another question. This is an important question. Over the years, more women writers have entered the crime and thriller genre. You mentioned before that we had a meet and greet before, and you were saying that there's a lot of new writers. There's a lot of exciting things happening in thriller and crime writing. And I want to get a sense from you, what women authors in the genre really stand out to you, besides Sherry Lapina, of course? Well, there's there's so many right now. And, and I was mentioning to you earlier about the Canadian ones, but I'll start off first with, you know, some British writers that I greatly admire. One is um, Kara Hunter, who writes a series about um, D.I. Adam Folly, which I think is superb. And I think it's going to be the new line of duty. It's a fantastic um, series about a police uh, crime investigator. And, um, and there's another writer I love called Flynn Berry, who's a wonderful stylist, and, and she writes really fine crime novels. In the States, I'm really interested in Laura McHugh, who again is a very fine writer. She writes crime novels. Um, Lisa Unger is very good. Her latest is superb, Confessions on the 745. And then, you know, we have a whole crop of, um, and I'm focusing on women here, um, but we have a whole crop of Canadian women writers, Samantha Bailey, Amy Stewart, um, Roz Ney, Jennifer Hillier, um, and Chevy Stevens, who's been around for a while. But we've got a lot of really good up-and-coming, Hannah McKinnon's another one, good up-and-coming Canadian women crime writers. Yeah. 
So there's no shortage of good crime writers out there. And even if you only wanted to read women, you would have a ton of writers to read. And Sheila Kamal is another one. Um, sorry, Sheena Kamal. Uh, so there, there are a lot of, if you're interested in, in women's fiction with crime in it, there's a lot of it. And a lot of them explore women's issues, whether it's you know postpartum depression or abuse or powerlessness in society or whatever. There's crime novels have it all. So um, yeah, there's a lot of good fiction out there right now. So Sherry, I was wondering, this is probably a question you get asked a lot, but I'm still really curious. How do you come up with the ideas in your books? How do you come up with the idea of of uh, of set of the setup and how you're going to tell that story? You know, ideas are a funny thing. They they just you know sometimes they just come to you out of the blue, like the couple next door. It just hit me in the head. I don't know why. Um, with this particular one, the end of her, <coughs> it came from something I read online that was you know inspired me to write this story, and it was. Um, and I mentioned this in the meet and greet, but it was a story on the news that I saw online about um, a family where a man had been digging his uh, car out of the snow and his wife had gone into the car to stay warm when it was running and she died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And so, you know, I can give my little public service announcement now, um, winter's coming. If, you're, um, if your car is buried in snow and the tailpipe is stuffed with snow, please don't wait in the in the running car because you'll die of carbon monoxide poisoning. So that was an idea. I, I read that and I thought, oh, what a perfect murder because, um, you know, it'd be so easy to get away with it. And so that was sort of the starting idea for the end of her. Um, and we have a character in that book, Patrick, whose first wife died in a snowy car because the tailpipe was plugged. And the question in the book is, was it an accident the way it was ruled or did he in fact intentionally murder her? So that one, I, I, I got the idea online. Um, the book I'm working on now, similarly, it's based on, it's very, very loosely based on a crime um, that happened in real life. Sometimes I just get a spark of an idea for the couple next door. It was just, I live in a semi-detached house and I thought, well, you know, would you go next door and leave your baby at home and bring the monitor? And that got me thinking of all the terrible things that could happen if you were to do that. And, and that's how that book was born. So it's always a little different, but often it's from reading or, you know, reading the paper or seeing something online or just hearing a snippet of a story somewhere. As long as, you know, ideas are everywhere, but the, the tricky thing is to get an idea that um, will take you somewhere that no one else has gone. That's something that you can make a little fresh and a little more interesting. So it's finding the right idea that's the, the challenge. I think this relates to our next question then. After you've written four thrillers over the last four years, so that's like, you know, one after the other, what parts of the process have become easier along the way? And the more you write thrillers, does it become challenging to keep things unpredictable? Mm. Well, the part that I think has definitely become easier is the promotion. So, you know, when you're a, a thriller writer and you're on a book a year and you're touring, you're doing a lot of traveling a lot of touring and speaking and TV and radio. And, you know, that's a bit of a learning curve when you're starting out, but I've done it a lot now. So I'm a lot more comfortable with the promotion end of things. So I think that's what has become easier. As far as writing the books go, they don't seem to get any easier. And um, I've spoken to other writers about this. Every book is just really hard work and every book is a challenge and for some reason, writing books does not seem to get easier the more you do it, which is unfortunate. But um, yeah, writing the books doesn't get any easier. But I think what does get easier is um, you always know that you'll figure it out. So I mean, that that pressure on the second book um, where you think you're never going to get the book done, that that doesn't happen anymore because I, I know we'll get the book done and I know I'll be happy with it. But um, yeah, they're all difficult to write. So you've talked about a little bit earlier and in some of your other interviews, you've talked about the fact that you don't approach thrillers with an outline and you sort of let it happen organically. Um, what, how do you know that you're on the right track as that's happening? And how do you figure out, um, like what happens when you get stuck? 
Do you ever get stuck with that? And and how do you navigate your way through that? Um, I think, you know, as long as I'm excited and things are happening and I'm enjoying it and things are moving along and I'm it's feeling twisty, then I think I'm on the right track. Um, the On the rare occasion when I kind of get stuck, then what I do is I sort of retreat a little bit and I look and I see where I might have missed an opportunity or um, where I maybe dropped a conflict somewhere or I kind of dropped something that I could have developed more and that usually gets me past it. I mean, I don't normally get myself backed into a corner. Um, I'm lucky that way. Um, actually, I'm surprised at how seldom that happens, given how I how I approach my books, that I, I don't often get into a dead end. But um, yeah, sometimes I do have to take stock and say, what could I do instead if I'm not liking the way this is going? Um, and so, of course, successful thriller writers, I think um, they have to persuade their readers to follow them through all kinds of twists and turns, sometimes outlandish things, sometimes um, surprising things, secrets. And it really challenges us to rethink the characters just chapter after chapter. And that's what I found really great about this book. It always put me in question about the characters. I thought I knew them and then it turns out mm, maybe I didn't know them so well. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure you keep readers hanging on along the way and not throw them off along the sides along the way in all these twists and turns? Oh yes, that's, that's a good question. Um, it's really, with, with a thriller, thrillers are tricky because with a thriller it's all about how you reveal information to the reader. So you have to reveal, you know, the right information at the right time in the right way so that the reader is feeling a lot of suspense. But you also, you can't afford to lose them, as you say, off the side. You have to, it, it, you have to be subtle, but you can't be so subtle that they miss the point. So it's really a balancing act between um, being subtle and not being too subtle. And, and that's something you really have to work on in revision too, to make sure that you don't want to lose your reader, but you don't want to hit them over the head with the obvious stuff either. So, you know, on the one hand, you have to reveal information in a way that you get the maximum suspense, but the way that you do reveal it has to be subtle enough that it works as suspense, but it's not so subtle that you don't get it. So it's, it's tricky. I'm going to switch gears, but before I do, I think feeling twisty is my new favorite phrase. We should get you a whole series of t-shirts that say feeling twisty. <laughs> feeling <laughs> twisty? <laughs> um, so I want to go back to the pandemic. Um, I know it's on a lot of our minds. And I just was wondering if there's been any bright spots to this. Has the pandemic inspired any new plot lines? Has it made you think about any new settings or any ways to sort of capitalize on the situation that we're in? No, I I can't be wait to be I can't wait to be done with the pandemic. I don't have any interest in writing a book on the pandemic right now. I specifically the book that I'm working on now, I've designed it so that it comes to an end right before the pandemic hits. So I don't even have to deal with it because I don't want to deal with it anymore. Um it's you know, my thoughts on her on it are that it would be very hard to write a book set in a pandemic because <laughs> right away it would have to be a locked room because we're all, <laughs> we're all locked down. <laughs> um, and it's just, you know, you can't, you can't do a lot. People can't meet, they can't go anywhere. They can't, it's be hard to write a thriller based in on a pandemic, but I mean, somebody will do it and they'll do a brilliant one. It's just, it's not something that interests me right now. Um, no, no, I'm not going to do a pandemic thriller. I'm just going to write books that are never set in 2020. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> just skip 2020. And These are all skip 2020. Anyway, like, oh. <laughs> so you are working on another book. Can you give us any hints about what that book's going to be about? Yeah, it's called, I don't like to say too much, but it's, it is called um, Not a Happy Family. And it's about the murder of a wealthy couple in their home. And it's about the family structure and the, the, the kids in the family, the extended family, um, and, you know, who killed them. And it's twisty and it's sort of a psychological mystery. So I'm enjoying writing that one. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, sounds good. Uh, you've, you've hooked me already in that just little two sentences. So thanks for that. Um, we are going to move on to a lightning round. Before we do that, I just want to remind folks, I see some questions coming in for the Q&A. Suzanne's going to lead us through a bit of a Q&A after this lightning round. So get your questions in now for Sherry Lapina, um, author of The End of Her. I'm trying to find the, the camera so you see it. Okay, so my lightning round question starts. What's your worst spelling or grammar faux pas? Incorrect use of possessives. I can't stand that. You know, I'm very fussy about my plural possessives and my it's versus it's. And I just like, why can't people get that? I don't know. That that just bugs me. <laughs> I'm the kind of person I would like to, when I see the sign on the, on the storefront and I use it incorrectly, I just want to fix it. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. No, there are people out there who do oh. do that. I know. And I'm an English teacher and I just, I want to get my red pen and I just want to change it. <laughs> I love it. Okay, next question. Best advice somebody gave you as a writer? Um, I think write write what excites you, because um, that's that's the way you get the energy out in your writing. And it has to be, you know, writing a novel is a long haul, and you have to be working on something that really does excite you for the long haul. And I think if you do that, then the excitement will come through on the page for the reader. Okay, your ideal writing environment. You got to give us some details on setting, snacks, drinks, music, silence. Okay, that's more than evening. <laughs> I like an empty house. I haven't had an empty house in, you know, eight months. I like absolute silence. I like my own desk in my empty, quiet house. And I can't use music. It has to be quiet. And I like my cat nearby. And I like my coffee. And I like my dark chocolate. And I don't like any interruptions. So that has not been this year. At all. Maybe that's why yeah, I, not I feel ideal. like I haven't productive. It's because the house is full and noisy. And yeah, I like quiet. And, and also, I like a you read and lately. it's hard to get out. <laughs> oh, yeah. When you're locked in the house, it doesn't stay clean, does it? <laughs> no, no. And I, I like to keep clutter to a minimum. It keeps my head clutter to a minimum, but I, I've given up on that whole thing right now. <laughs> okay. I've been the very best lucky. book you've read lately. Oh, um, best book I've read lately. Oh, I just finished last week. It was um, Denise Minna's Conviction, which I just loved. I, it was the first time I've read of, her, of hers. And it was such an interesting, fun book. I really liked that conviction. What's a book that's on your reading list? Oh, well, I put a couple on my Christmas list. Um, one is Anthony Horowitz's The Moonflower Murders, because I, I love his books. I read all his books. Um, they're very active, Christie kind of twisty and meta, meta fiction. Um, and the other one was, uh, oh, Lisa Jewell. I put her on my Christmas list, The Invisible Girl. Okay, yeah, let's see. Them. What are you been? Go ahead, say that again. And I'd better get them for Christmas, or I won't be happy. Because <laughs> I could have just gone out. Okay. And gone, so I better be getting them for Christmas. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay. Um, what are you binge watching or listening to nowadays? Oh, that's easy. So. I loved the chess one, um, The Queen's Gambit, that everybody's raving about. I absolutely loved that series on Netflix. It was so interesting. And then I just last night, we finished The Crown um, about the, the royal family on Netflix. So, and I loved that. Um, and now I'm looking for a new show. So I, I don't know what we're going to watch next. But yeah, I highly recommend The Crown and The Queen's Gambit. Anything about the pandemic new normal that you actually hope will continue on after? No. <laughs> I, I can't think of anything. That I no. Like, no. No, I can't. Can you think of anything? I somebody give me something that's good about the pandemic that that I mean research is a good thing. They should keep up with research, but I 
day to day life in terms of pandemic. No, I the kids are home from school. It's terrible. The kids are doing university from home. It's you know nobody likes what we're doing right now. I no no. no. I can't think of a single redeeming well, feature. The only hey, thing I can think of is maybe the elastic pants. I, I feel like no shame in wearing elastic pants all day, every day. Well, I used to do that anyway. I'm a writer. I just wear yoga pants all day long. So that hasn't helped me any. <laughs> um, no, I, yeah. What a, Anything else? I can't think of anything really. I become really well acquainted with my stove um, in ways like I like cooking, but now I like cook all the time. And that's oh. kind of nice. Oh, see, I hate cooking. <laughs> I, you know, I get, yeah, I can't think of anything because of the pandemic. Oh, but I, the only thing I can think is it, it does make me appreciate, like, I am very grateful because you realize how quickly and how awfully things can go wrong. And we have been very fortunate, like I said before in the meet and greet, that my husband and I both work from home. My kids are still able to go to university, although it's at home online. Um, whereas, I mean, I feel terrible for the kids who've missed a lot of school, the younger kids, the people who've lost their businesses, their jobs, the, you know, awful. And I still don't know anyone who's been sick, but so many people have died. So, you know, if anything, I've, I've become more grateful. That's, you know, but so many people have had things so much worse that I don't, Think that's a silver lining yeah what can you um look forward to when the restrictions are gone Ooh, me personally i i'm looking forward to going back to literary festivals and you know signing books for people and talking to other writers and just getting out of the house because writing is a pretty solitary um profession so i mean you're home alone with your computer all day and so most of us like to go out and go to things in the evening or, you know, I miss Biblio Bash. I, I miss book launches. I miss, I miss it all because it's the social part of being a writer and, you know, Zoom and everything's fine, but it's not the same. You know, you don't really get to mingle and meet in the way that you normally would. So I'm looking forward to things going back to normal that way. Yeah. Okay. And my last question um, what three people, alive or dead, would you have in your pandemic social bubble? <laughs> well, recently, um, I've just, I, I could certainly use an osteopath because I'm having some back issues. Like, <laughs> I can't go out to an osteopath yeah. anymore. Um, Agatha Christie, because I have some questions that I would like to ask her. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a big fan of Oscar Wilde. And, you know, I could use the odd Bon Mo during the day just to cheer me up. So I would say Oscar Wilde. I imagine he'd be a great companion to be locked in with, you know, be a laugh a minute. <laughs> All right, let's go to our Q&A. Suzanne, do you wanna kick that off? Yeah, so there's um, so there's some questions that have been coming in, um, and I think we'll see some of them come up on the screen shortly. But the uh, the first question that I wanted to ask is, when does your new book come out? So I always have a new book out in July, towards the end of July. So the new one will be out end of July this year. I don't know the exact date, but it's usually the, the second last or the last week in July in uh, the US, Canada and the UK. And it's called Not a Happy Family. And that is an understatement. They were a very unhappy family. <laughs> Um, so I know you've talked a little bit. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, do you think uh, uh, about what actors you'd love to have cast? And let's just talk about the end of her. Have you ever thought about what actors you'd love to have cast in the TV or movie version of this book? You know, people always ask me that, and I never have an answer because I don't. I don't really know who the actors are. So, but you know, I find I have a lot of people on Instagram who follow or on my Facebook, they say, Oh, I think the lead should be so and so or so and so, and I don't even know who they are. But um, for the end of her, uh, oh, I don't know, like I think um, um, for the end of her, I don't know, I like Patrick needs to be kind of a good looking but nervy kind of guy, and I need a woman actress for the second wife, Stephanie, who's losing her mind. So that um, Mina 
Well, who's the one that did Black Swan that was so good? Um, Mina Kunis. Mina Kunis, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And for the evil woman, oh, the one that played, whoever the woman was that played um, uh, in Gone Girl, the blonde woman who played um, the character in Gone Girl, she was a wonderful sort of evil character. And I've forgotten the actor's name. So I'm not very good with actors, I'm afraid. And I always, you know, let myself off the hook with that because I know that the, the writer doesn't get to pick the, the actors anyway. So <laughs> it's completely out of my hands. So I don't really spend a lot of time worrying about who the actors are going to be. Well, maybe I'll ask you, should it be, would you make it a, a novel or sorry, not a novel, a movie or would you want a TV series? Oh, definitely prefer a TV series. Definitely. All the really good work seems to be being done on series. I don't even watch that many movies anymore. Um, the really like all everything that I love is a series, a limited series. And, and that just seems to be where the good scripts are, where all the interesting work's being done. Um, movies, somehow just putting everything into 90 minutes or two hours doesn't do it justice. And um, they tend to get the Hollywood treatment instead of the yeah, so absolutely serious if I could get it. That's what I mean, that's what Couple Next Door is supposed to be. Paramount TV has that one and they're supposed to be doing a series on that one. So we'll see if, if that happens. It would be nice. Yeah, it would be nice. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Sherry, what are you reading? Um, you talked a little bit about some of the books that you've been reading and you talked a bit about some of your favorite authors. Is there anyone else you want to add to that list? Oh, okay. Who did I mention before? Who am I reading? So right now I've got the new Lisa Gardner coming in. So that's going to be really good. I've got, I've told you I'm looking forward to the new Lisa Jewell, uh, the Anthony, uh, Anthony Horowitz coming in at Christmas. Um, I want to try a Sophie Hanna. She does um, interesting Agatha Christie um, books. Um, what else have I got coming up? The Push by Ashley Audrain is a Canadian writer. Um, so she's, she's getting a lot of attention for that book. Um, who else? I've got a whole stack of them on my Jennifer Hillier's latest. I've got on my bookshelf. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I have so many and whenever anyone asks me, you know, what I'm reading, I always go blank, but, um, um, yeah, I, I've written a few down. Kara Hunter, I think I mentioned Lisa Unger's really good. Um, Jillian McMillan, I love, um, and some of the writers that I think are um, some of the women writers I mentioned earlier that I think are really good stylists that maybe don't get as much attention are uh, Flynn Berry and uh, Laura McHugh. I think they're really, really good. That's great. Thank you. Um, do best-selling authors like you belong to book clubs? That's a great question. <laughs> are you in a book club? Yeah. I have belonged to a book club for like 25 years on my street. And it's only in the last couple of years that I often don't make it to book club because they're generally doing a book that I don't have time to read because I'm reading. I do a lot of reading for like, if I do an interview, I read the books of the people that I'm interviewing. If I'm um, going to be on a panel, I try to read the books of the people that I'm on the panel with. And then I do a lot of blurbs. And so I, I often have a stack, um, really high of books that I'm reading. So I don't necessarily have time to read the book that the book club picks. So I'm sort of an on again, off again book club uh, member. And also we we haven't met since the pandemic started. So I'm not sure what's happening with that. <laughs> I like how um, I just I, need I, to read. I was just gonna say, I like Sorry, how go you ahead, choose. Susan. Sure, I, I like how you choose not to go to book clubs when you haven't read the book. I will still go to that book club. I will eat all the hummus and I will drink all the wine. I sometimes do that. <laughs> if you do that too often, they start to think you're just a freeloader. That's true. Yes. <laughs> it's a fireball fence. <laughs> um, I just have to share some of these comments that people have. I think they're excellent. So people were saying, um, to that question about is there anything that we would want to continue on after the pandemic is over? Um, people are talking about supporting local businesses is a, is a plus side, perhaps. Um, somebody said the, another good thing about it is being able to order wine or beer with your pickup restaurant order. I thought that was a good one. And oh, another I one is the. Yep. Yeah, another one is the clearing of air in the most polluted places 
Plus the rewilding of places because of a lack of people. So I just wanted to share that with you. There are some bright spots. Yeah, I was I was feeling good about the environmental bit of it a few months ago. And then they said, actually, it's not really helped that much because all of the one use plastics with all of the disposable PPE and everything, it's really not been that helpful. So yeah, I'm a little concerned about that, but uh, maybe people will be more aware because there has been some air clearing in certain places that has been noticeable. So um, that's good. But I think overall the emissions haven't been that much improved. Um, yeah, so we're quite environmentalists in this house. So that's a concern, yeah. But yeah, good point. Um, so another question, what has been the most, pinch me, is this really happening moment of your career so far? Oh, I guess that would be when the first, my first thriller that went so quickly and, you know, so, you know, with so much excitement in New York, because I'd been a Canadian literary writer and Canadian literary fiction is usually kind of quiet unless you're a big name. Um, so to go to New York and sell to a really big house and then sell internationally all over, um, that was that was a real pinch me moment. <laughs> I've had a few of them too. Like whenever I get invited, some like I don't get as you know, um, it doesn't. It's not such a pinch me moment now. But you know, back early in my career when I was getting invited to places like Dubai and Beijing and all, it was very 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 exciting um, to be invited to these places and flown all around and you know, it really makes you feel like a bit of a princess in a fairy tale. Now I'm used to the international travel. I'm missing it because um, of lockdown, but um, it will come back. Um, so on that, uh, on that theme of our wistful thinking of trips we've done, um, in your career, what trip outside of Canada was especially interesting for you? Oh, there's been so many. Like I mentioned, Dubai was fascinating. Um, we stayed in the desert in a tent. It was it was so interesting. Um, I think Turkey, Istanbul, was particularly interesting because we stayed. It was a crime festival held in the Para Palace Hotel, which is the hotel in Istanbul that Agatha Christie stayed in when she wrote Murder on the Orient Express and and some other books. And we were the room that we were in was right across the hall from her room which they still had decorated with her, you know, typewriter and everything. So that was really cool because it was still, you know, it still had that 1920s, 30s feel and it had like, you know, high tea. And it just, it just, you just felt like you were living in Agatha Christie's time. And it was just so full of atmosphere. And I was just, it was really exciting. It was fun for me because I was working on Unwanted Guest at a time and that was my most Christie-like book. So I was really soaking it up. And Iceland, I think. Iceland was fascinating. I went to a festival in Iceland and I really, really enjoyed Iceland. But, you know, I, I, I love all the places I go. You know, Scotland. I can see you really glowing as you talk well, about travel. Yeah. yeah. This year alone, I was supposed to go to Prague and London and New York and like all sorts of places that, you know, didn't happen. But, um, you know, maybe next year. Yeah. So I asked this question in our meet and greet earlier on, and I, I will ask it here too. Um, your endings um, don't necessarily have it all wrapped up and every little bow tied. And I would love to hear your thoughts about the pros and cons, the yeses and nos of open endings in a thriller context. Okay, well, I, you know, I feel like wrapping things up in a bow is just so not like real life. Um, life is messy and it just sprawls on and it never comes to a nice end and things are never, and it just, it's just not lifelike to tie everything up perfectly. So I always like, the reason I have open endings in my novels is I like for the reader to feel that the lives of the characters go on beyond the page. So when you close the book, you still feel like those characters are alive and dealing with new problems. But I think it's really important to always resolve the central question in every novel, which is usually a murder mystery. So it's like, who did the crime or, you know, who really did what and why? So I resolve that always in order to give the reader a sort of a satisfying read, but I like to leave it with 
a little twist at the end of some new thing coming up that may or may not happen or some unanswered question that will leave the reader after the book thinking, oh, I wonder what's going to go on next. So that way you get, you just feel like there's a life that goes on after the book's closed. So we're at the end of our time and we want to be respectful of Sherry's time. So that's a great way for us to end. Um, thank you so much, Sherry, for joining us. Thank you for your uh, great book that we got a chance to read. And folks, um, I would like to encourage you that if you get a chance to read this book, make sure you set enough time to read the whole thing because you will lose sleep. You will lose working paid time. And we don't want to do that right now. We don't want to do that to you. So just fair warning for that. Thank you so much, Sherry. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Good night. Um, Edward, good night. We're just going to do a little bit of a wrap up now. And, you know, I think that we've had so many wonderful events and so many fun things happening. And I just want to thank you for joining us and for being a part of this. And I want to just remind you that come November 25th, so just two days away from now, we're going to start our Act Together launch. Um, this is a campaign that we're doing with The Body Shop, and it's so, um, I think it's so important right now because we are experiencing a increased risk of gender-based violence in the pandemic in Canada. Not just in Canada, we're seeing spikes all over the place, but Canada, of course, is top of mind for us at the Canadian Women's Foundation. And we are going to do a live stream launch on uh, Facebook, November 25th at 2 o'clock p.m. So we would just want to encourage you um, to join us 2 o'clock p.m. EST and uh, just participate in that with us. Find out a little bit more, more about the campaign. Find out about the activities that you can do. There's 16 activities that you can do over 16 days between November 25th and December 10th. And um, I think that it's really important for us to use this opportunity to raise awareness on gender-based violence. There's been times that there's been more awareness and less awareness of this issue in Canada. And I think now's the time for us to get really loud and really big about it and try to do something now. Life is not the same. And as we know, dangerous homes become even more dangerous in the pandemic. I also want to highlight for you a couple of events, book events that we have coming up. We have um, a really special Reads to Challenge Gender-Based Violence discussion. Again, we're going to do it on Facebook. It's with Julie Lalonde, December the 2nd. And Julie is a writer herself, and she wrote about her experience with gender-based violence called Resilience is Futile, the Life and Death, or the Death and Life of Julia Lalonde. And I think this is going to be a really important and interesting one because Julie will share about her book and she'll also share about the idea of reading to learn more about gender-based violence. We learn about gender-based violence because people told their stories. We also learn because people who are advocates brought out those voices and brought out those hidden experiences and they're often very hidden given the, the fact that it often happens behind closed doors between people who know and trust each other. So that's a really important one. I want to encourage you to join us on December 2nd for that. There's another one that we're having with Jessica J. Lee. Um, she is the writer of Two Trees Make a Forest. And this is a fantastic book that just got uh, a, a big award and it's a memoir. And so it's another interesting read that I think you'll really love. Um, I have rarely read a book that really described place so vividly and it really drew me in. So I, I think that you'll enjoy that one as well too. That's on December the 11th, um, that's a Friday and it's going to be at 4.30. And I want to encourage you to go to our website, canadianwomen.org um, slash tireless readers collective and you'll be able to find all the information for that. So that's it folks. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to remind you that if you want to give to the Out of Violence Fund, we're really pushing this this holiday season because we know the risks of gender-based violence increase um, during the holidays. It's a very stressful time for a lot of people. And we also know that with the pandemic, it's kind of a double whammy that we're experiencing this year. And your money that you give supports grassroots organizations in every province and territory doing anti-violence work to end gender-based violence. And this is really important. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize that survivors need our support right now. And it's important for us to really support the grassroots organizations doing this stuff 
in their communities because that's where people go. People don't go to authorities. They don't feel safe necessarily going to authorities or it's just not what they want to happen. They want to be able to have the violence stop and they want some control over the situation as well too. And so that's where the grassroots organizations come in. I really want to encourage you to go to our website, canadianwomen.org and find the information about that. And just um, if you can give right now, it's a tough time for a lot of people, but we've seen a lot of um, incredible support. So if you would like to support an organization this season, give to this fund and know that you're supporting a lot of organizations all over the country doing this work in every province and territory. So I'm just going to end uh, with a very important video. We are promoting right now as well our Signal for Help campaign. And this signal is something that if you see somebody do this on a video call, that's a sign for you to reach out to them in a safe way. Say, hey, I am here. Reach out to me. Let me know what you need. It lets people know that you need help with something going on in your life right now. And perhaps it's violence, perhaps it's abuse. And you just want people to know in this video call context that you need their support. So um, check out this video and go to our website for more information about the Signal for Help. Have a great rest of the night. Thank you so much for joining us, folks. Can you that banana bread recipe? Sure, it's, it's actually my mom's banana bread recipe, but it's, uh, it's pretty foolproof and super easy. Well, I really appreciate it. I know your mom's a great baker, so should be good.